Um, I'm going to do a uh, sort of extended Pecha Kucha today. So I have 27 slides, 30, 20 seconds a slide, auto advance, so it will be done in exactly nine minutes. Are you ready? <laughs> Starting now. So one of the things that I like about this particular picture is it's actually uh, an aircraft flying at 1,100 miles, uh, canceling the rotation of the Earth. The reason I like this is because it's something that shows something that rather mundane, this rotation of the Earth, but in a really interesting way. And I think that's what we're discovering with a lot of these environmental sensing, that we're seeing things that have been around us all the time. Some of the problems that we're able to look at are things like environmental sensing, but also issues of poverty and agriculture and the environment and health care. These are wicked problems. They're very challenging and difficult to sort of uh, traditional engineering methods don't often apply, but design research and other techniques do. One of the things I've had the fortune to do over the last you know, decade or more is look at these kinds of environmental sensing applications. Some of them are things that are more traditional, things embedded into mobile devices where we collect data, crowdsource through uh, into maps. Um, whereas we've looked at other ways people might experience these particular data sets. So we've also attached them to the urban infrastructure. So the city of San Francisco let us attach a number of these to street sweepers and other city vehicles to collect data around the city and around the environment, um, which allowed us to, of course, have maps, but also have these broader perspective of what's happening. We also looked at not just these outdoor locations, but even indoor. So the, the kinds of exposures you have to various particles in the air. Uh, we did longitudinal studies, you know, on the order of six, or, or, um, long, six months or longer, where people could see the indoor air quality of their friends or family. This promoted people over the study to actually improve their indoor air quality. Um, and we did this around 2008, 2009, where we're sort of developing and deploying these kinds of ways of visualizing things. Of course, now you can go out and bought, purchase a lot of these products. About five years later, this is just four of them. But they all are this Internet of Things that's embracing this kind of new way of seeing our world, and they're looking at how you might have air quality sensing embedded into them. Now, we also looked at maybe you don't own these objects personally. Maybe they're not on the infrastructure, but maybe they're given to communities or groups. For this example, what if individuals, say bicyclists or parents, uh, a homeless community or activists, how would they move sensors around um, if they had a limited resource of them? And we performed these experiments and saw they own all, each have their own narrative of what they want to do with these. And they, they want to tell something different. So one size doesn't fit all. We also looked at how you might expose or the data to people. So, of course, graphs and charts and maps, but also maybe we had a T-shirt that has air quality sensing. We've made new signage, maybe not the shortest route through a city, but the cleanest route. Really trying to broadly look at how you might experience this data. In fact, even looking at creating a spectacle. So we had some air quality sensing balloons, very low cost, that basically glowed based on the particle counts or different gas counts. But now people, they approach the balloons, or what is this, and we hand it to them, and now they're part of the sensing. It's a different way to engage. It doesn't look like you're holding a mobile phone with something that has kind of a sensor legibility to it. How low cost can you go? We tried to look at actually using very low cost, postal kind of citizen science, if you speak, where you can actually just leave out a piece of paper, it collects particles, uh, on for pennies, really the cost of the postage is the main driver of that. The main thing is you don't get numbers back, you actually get a visible picture of what you're breathing. It's a very different experience that we wanted to look at and expose people to. The other issue was even sensing itself. Sometimes we think about sensors as these electronic devices, but all around us are sensors. The environment's actually telling us a lot, and if we can provide tools to allow people to read and interpret these, our devices promote more looking up and exploring than looking down and hitting sort of buttons and can keypads. We do do some sensor innovation. This is a new uh, low-cost particle sensor that we've uh, been uh, developing in the lab, and it's showing really promising results compared to particle sensor of, of uh, several thousand dollars, actually. But even when you think about sensing, some of these things, were I talked a little bit about air quality, but there's lots of other things that um, people have brought up earlier. We've also looked at soil sensing, where it's often a slow process. These are Wittegaski columns that let you sort of measure the kinds of uh, heavy metal content in soils. And we allowed people to kind of have a different, really interactive experience of seeing the soil and seeing these kind of, kind of uh, bioelectric hybrid with biosensing. We've looked at uh, DNA. We have a PCR machine. As you know, this lets you kind of replicate DNA. People can, we can have, we've had workshops where people can test if they have genetically modified food that they're eating or if it has any kind of, uh, if they have, people have food allergies. 
really that people are going to start to have really deep, uh, insightful information about their world at this kind of DNA level of, of visualization. Also thinking about children's toys, we've thought about how we can invite that curiosity. Um, this is some basically children's toys, a digger that actually samples the soil quality as you dig, and it has an e-ink screen that shows, it kind of expresses the kinds of quality of the soil. And it invites children to sort of in, bring their own narrative to these kinds of toys. We, of course, have a boat with a total dissolved solid sensor and an airplane with a particle sensor on it. The whole idea is that these kinds of devices bring that new landscape of thinking about how should we explore our world. And staying on that theme for a minute, we also thought other things that might be for sort of children to as exploratory toys. One of them is the adventure watch. We're all used to navigating with the GPS exactly to a location, but if you've ever been with a child, they're more interested in the things you're passing and missing. So the, to uh, the, the cool playground, the train you went by, the skate park, and the adventure watch lets you explore things just at a visible range, but close enough you could go um, explore them um, as a child. And finally, just inviting another dialogue about things you might not see directly. So there's over 15,000 orbiting satellites that are passing overhead, and the overhead is a project that actually reports information about these objects as they pass overhead, something that's sort of always around us but kind of out of reach, and this opens up a conversation in that direction. Now back to citizen science, basically there's this usual technique of there's some problem, an invasive species, you're asked to go out and photograph it, give it to some uh, sort of other person that then marshals forces and solves the problem. Um, admittedly, this is a great approach and it's had a lot of success. The issue is, at least for us, uh, is we've had a lot of issues where people want to do their own campaigns. So could people basically develop their own? Very similar to the sort of fun if, uh, in a box where we've developed tools for people to collage together their own campaigns of what they'd like to measure or monitor. And this empowers people that don't have any programming skills, don't have server access, don't have uh, a sort of, they don't have to pay for uh, an app store charge to basically deploy these kinds of devices. And then also a sort of subscription model where I might be interested in looking at uh, or subscribing to certain things that I'm willing to provide measurements for in my particular area. Um, again, in, in the spirit of you might be near a location or near a stream or near a particular intersection, it's really about micro-volunteerism. This idea of I have 42 seconds, how can I volunteer my time? And also how can I sort of uh, interpret this data. So many people are going to want to look at this data from different perspectives and for different reasons. And so there's, we're going to have to start providing a lot of different interfaces. And actually there's some really good parts of the lightning talks earlier in that keynote as well that talked about this. But even just deploying this uh, sensor project for uh, you know, maybe a little over a year or so, but the idea is that people have kind of found it. We have people doing school children doing wildlife monitoring and wetland monitoring, and even people in Italy using it to report potholes. We're seeing a wealth of people that have their own ideas and we need to sort of get out of the way and provide them the tools to do that. And my last story is about Bodega Bay in 1963. We're just about here on the free speech movement 50 year anniversary. This was right before that. And that dig site is for a nuclear reactor that was gonna be placed there. The people there with the balloons are not celebrating, they're protesting. They're protesting by releasing balloons with a little note on it attached to each one. And the note says, that this balloon represents a radioactive molecule of stromium-90 or iodine-131. It's a really ingenious way to sort of invite the public to participate in one of these lands in your yard, and you realize that you would have been exposed to this particular issue. Um, luckily, the reactor was not built, literally within a kilometer of the San Andreas Fault, and now if you go to the site, you can see this. Um, and really, we're trying to think a lot about how we might promote the idea of having people have these kind of flying ways of interpreting data out in sort of everyday space. And one of the projects is this idea of flixels, these flying pixels using quadcopters. The idea is that you could actually use them. Um, we saw some really good ideas around uh, measuring the kind of environment, but collections and swarms of those as these airborne, scalable, dynamic kind of interactive uh, systems that can create a new kind of public display. And there's lots of different application spaces we see for this, but we really think that it provides a new authoring tool for people to participate in kind of not just urban life, but in sort of public life. And finally, just want to thank the individuals that helped uh, really put a lot of this work together. It's a tremendous number of projects I went through in exactly nine minutes, so thank you. <laughs>